This is an American air base in East Anglia, on the east coast of England. This is from which American fighter planes swarmed up into battle against the Germans. Planes known as the P-47, the Thunderbolt. A fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wings. The Lightning, the P-38, master of the air in many theaters of war with its long range and concentrated firepower. The Mustang, the P-51, the longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. Into these three great fighters, America poured its genius, its millions of man-hours of labor, its faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed these men. Relaxing now, but not for long. At headquarters, 8th Air Force, General Doolittle is discussing fighter protection. The 8th Fighter Command will give fighter cover to targets and back from the targets. Desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down east of the Ruhr and strafe ground targets. The bomber plan, timing, altitudes, strength, course and targets reached the combat operations room at headquarters, 8th Fighter Command, Major General Kepner commanding. A field order goes out. 62nd Group P-47s will escort heavy bombers over enemy coast through target to limit of endurance. The machinery is set in motion. Now comes the briefing for the mission and everybody present. These Thunderbolt pilots are veterans of many missions, so the colonel gives them only the essentials. They are to escort the bombers to a target about 40 miles east of Mannheim and then proceed to the strafing of airdromes north of Frankfurt. They are given times of takeoff, rendezvous, escort, strafing. The pilots make notes on the backs or palms of their left hands. Intelligence warns them that they may expect considerable enemy opposition today. The Germans have brought in some 100 single-engine fighters. On the field, planes warm up. It's takeoff time for the Thunderbolts. At other bases, time to the escort schedule, the P-38s get underway. And it's still others. The long-range Mustangs go to keep their rendezvous with the bombers someplace deep in Germany. Somewhere out there over enemy territory, near or far, in the long route as the bombers go out and come home, each of these formations will make rendezvous at a certain point on the exact minute. The Thunderbolts climb steadily over the channel into hostile skies. close to rendezvous. And in the distance are the bombers. Advanced formations of an armada perhaps a hundred miles long. The Thunderbolts maneuver for their escort position. Each pilot searches the sky, constantly watching for the main enemy attack, which may come near the coast or deep in Germany, or hit and run sneak attacks by the enemy's aerial snipers. Then, at another rendezvous point, comes a group of Mustangs to relieve the Thunderbolts. This is Red Leader. Okay, men, it's time to break escort. Mustangs coming in at 8 o'clock. The Thunderbolts break escort. They head for home, watching for every possible strafing target on the way. The Mustangs, far in the distance, sweep the surrounding sky as they come in to take the places held by the Thunderbolts. One of the most important features of long-range fighter escort is this relay system. Because of the differences in bomber speeds and the need of much weaving, fighters used up their gas. Thus, the same group of fighters could remain with the bombers only 25 to 40 minutes out of a six or eight hour mission, going and coming. And a thousand fighters might be needed to keep anything from 40 to 100 on the job at all times. While the enemy could strike with 250 at any point he selected, 
Our fighter groups had to relieve at rendezvous points all along the route. But on the German side, the Luftwaffe was forewarned an hour and a half in advance, even as our bombers gained altitude over England. This captured German film shows how quickly their 109s and Fock Wolf 190s got into action after a warning. They had plenty of time to mass their fighters at a chosen point of attack and to outnumber our escort at anything from 2 to 1 to 10 to 1. They were as grimly determined to stop our great daylight thrusts into their industrial heart as our bombers and fighters were resolved to press them home. Meanwhile, deep in Germany, the group of escorting Mustangs watches every corner of the sky, weaving ahead, above, below, and all around the bombers like a screen of destroyers protecting the main fleet. They don't have long to wait for another rendezvous, this time with the enemy. Blue leader here. Watch it, fellows. 109 to 10 o'clock. They get rid of their long-range wing tanks before the fight. Then down they go for the kill. With a touch of a finger on the stick, a camera and eight machine guns are put into action. Small cameras set on the wings make the record. Too often poor pictures due to gun vibration. But they let you see what happens in the instant of action as the pilot sees it. The enemy fighters are massing for an attack on our bombers, while our pilots watch every move of their varied tactics. Yell in a blue flight. Looks like they're trying to lay us away from the bombers. Green leader here. You're right. Here comes another. Nine o'clock. The Jerry's make a sneak attack on our bombers from behind. Gun camera film, captured from the enemy, reveals how they hammer our bombers with their 22 millimeters. A B-17 catches fire and goes down in flames. This one had half his tail shot off, but is still going ahead. We lose another, but they can't stop us. Our fighters, often heavily outnumbered, engage the enemy all over the sky. And this battle is only one of many. Day after day, month after month. Mustangs. Thunderbolts. Lightnings. Against the enemy 109s and the Fock Wolf 190s. Our fighters attack, attack, attack. Two into 10, six into 50. They block the enemy's mass assaults until our victory column soars at the rate of four to one. If a missed rendezvous or other misadventure, due usually to blinding weather, prevented fighter protection somewhere, the bombers suffered heavy losses. But no American fighter ever failed them because of enemy odds, however great. Never was a mission turned back by enemy action. Increasing fleets of fortresses and liberators pressed onto their targets and dropped their loads. And the day arrived when a huge 8th Air Force bomber mission with full fighter escort was flown to Berlin and back without a challenge by a single enemy fighter. Before that eventful day, the Thunderbolts, Lightnings, and Mustangs had another mission to perform. Our bomber and fighter losses were strikingly less than the enemy's. 
But the home front sent us more bombers and fighters and more well-trained pilots, and our fleets grew mightier by the month. However, the enemy's first-line operational strength was maintained also. The Great Air Battle of Europe was still undecided. In February 1944, there was a sudden change. Our fighters were ordered to range wider, to seek the enemy in the air and on the ground instead of waiting for him, and above all, to follow him to his destruction. A gigantic fighter battle raged across the European skies with victories by our fighters alone of 60, 85, over 100 destroyed each day. The fight came down from almost invisible heights to the final decision perhaps only a few feet above the ground. Enemy warplanes of every kind and in fantastic numbers were splashed all over the landscape of northwestern Germany and occupied Holland, Belgium, France. This was a crucial battle. Both sides were aware of the coming events with air domination itself at stake. Once again, a better cause, better planning and leadership, better equipment, and beyond everything else, the valor of our fighter pilots gave us victory. Only this time, it was decisive. So many of the enemy's aircraft exploded over his own forest and housetops, or were driven flaming wrecks into the ground. So many of his famous fighter leaders met death at the hands of our pilots, that his morale was shattered. His defense plan was smashed. Quickly, our fighters seized their opportunity. Since the enemy did not come up to fight, down they went to blast his planes to pieces and burn them on his own airdromes all over Western Europe and in the very heart of Germany. It was the most savage and devastating fighter attack on record. Returning from unchallenged escort duty and on many special missions, they burned his aircraft by hundreds from one airfield to another. Intense enemy flak, sheets of machine gun fire from flak towers and ground installations caused us heavy losses. Four times as many as the same number of fighters would sustain in aerial combat. But our fighters never flinched, and by their courage, faced destruction in single-engine planes only a few feet above the ground, and 500 miles from their bases, until they had smashed the heavily concentrated frontline operational strength of the German Air Force forever. Now that the sky was ours, another great opportunity became ours too. The destruction of the enemy's transportation system that fed and supplied the great armies counted on to repel the Allied invasion forces. The enemy's roads and railroads were struck with the mighty force of air power. 
These were tense days, crucial days, and both sides knew it. Our fighters, freed by their bitterly won victory in the air, became a dominant factor on the ground. They exploded locomotives by the thousands and burned freight cars in uncounted numbers. No train in daylight hours was safe. No target too small. Even a single railroad car. No marshalling yard a haven. The enemy's desperately needed rail transport system was shattered all over the map. his barges. His oil tanks. Flak towers. Radio and radar stations. Trucks carrying ammunition and supplies. Staff cars carrying high German officials. This one might have been Rommel. Road traffic of every kind and description until enemy convoys could only move effectively at night. What did this mean to the German armies of the West? How did it count on invasion day in the Battle of Normandy? The answer is history. Our gallant armies are driving ahead without having to keep one eye cocked over their shoulders. Their gun emplacements unobserved. Everywhere about the mighty battle was and is the flash of American fighters. The Germans see them deep in their own sky and cringe. Our men see them above the grim fight and cheer. There are remembered names in the mess halls. Major Gerald Johnson, a crack shot. Major Goodson, gallant fighter. Major Duane Beeson, great tactician. Captain Eugene O'Neill, one of the best. Major Don Gentilly ran up a flaming record. Colonel Don Blakesley, great leader of 4th Group. Major Walker Mahuran one of the first and best of the great aces. Major Bob Johnson and all his victories. Lieutenant Colonel Gabreski with a great career. And Colonel Hubert Zemke, famous commander of 56. A score of victories or more are the records of them all. Duncan, Schilling, Pretty, and all our gallant fighter pilots who in the decisive hour smashed the Luftwaffe and gave us freedom of the air in Europe just as that freedom must now be gained in the Pacific. We were attacked by flamethrowers and the inside of my pillbox was charred to the walls. If any human being had lived through the fire, it must be called a true miracle. Yet a miracle did happen. Tadeo Anuki was a chief petty officer in the Imperial Japanese Navy. He was on the island of Tarawa in 1943. Today, he drives a taxi cab in Tokyo. Mickey Franklin is a beer and wine distributor today, living with his family in Southern California. In 1943, he fought at Tarawa as a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps. 
I don't care where you were on that island, you were right in the middle of the battle. The water was an awful red color from the blood of all the men who had lost their lives. It was a horrible thing to see. On the tiny atoll of Tarawa, the lives of Tadeo Onuki and Mickey Franklin came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Japanese, one American, relived that moment in history. Two years, the Gilbert Islands, located 2,500 miles southwest of Hawaii, have been under Japanese occupation. In the Gilberts is a group called Tarawa, and its principal island is Peishio. 3,800 yards long, 600 yards wide, the tiny atoll includes an airfield and a defense system that make it, in 1943, one of the most heavily fortified islands in the world. Surrounding the island, barbed wire. And on the beaches, a barricade built of coconut logs. Captured eight-inch guns from Singapore guard the coastal approaches. Field guns, pillboxes, anti-aircraft guns, and machine guns are planted across the island. A series of shelters with five-foot-thick concrete roofs and ten-foot-thick walls is constructed. Only a direct hit by a 2,000-pound bomb can smash them. The Japanese have not only fortified Tarawa, but have moved 4,500 of their best marines in to defend it. The island commander, Rear Admiral Kiji Shibisaki, declares that Tarawa cannot be taken by a million men. One of the men brought in to help keep that promise is Chief Petty Officer Tadeo Onuki. Our company is called the 3rd Special Base Company of Yokosuka and we spend many busy days building the positions and battle training. There is hardly any speculation about the war or about our assignments to Pechio. If someone is foolish enough to ask, what are we doing here? Or, what is the point of holding this little strip of rock? We quickly silence him, for fear the talk will leak to the higher officers. In the Imperial Navy, such individual breaches of discipline bring a mass punishment for all. Now in November 1943, ships of the newly formed American 5th Fleet begin steaming toward the Gilbert Islands and the conquest of Tarawa. Aboard are 18,000 Marines, the 2nd Marine Division, tough veterans of Guadalcanal and Tulagi. When the troops hit the beach, they will be under the command of Colonel David M. Shoup. One of the Marines aboard is his runner, 18-year-old Private First Class Mickey Franklin. Four days after we put out to sea, they tell us where we're going. They bring out a map of Tarawa, showing the coral reef and everything. When we hear about all the shelling and bombing they are going to do before we land, everybody feels a little more relieved. Most of us now feel as though we can practically run up there on the island and take it over. The whole island is supposed to be level before we get there. I don't really feel much different about going to Tarawa than when we went in at Guadalcanal or Tulagi. Our practice maneuvers for this one are about the same, except the pressure seems to be on a little bit more. Not from the men themselves, but from the higher-ups. They want things done with more accuracy and everything. D-Day is set for November 20th, and one week before, 400 planes begin a round-the-clock bombing.
bombing cannot obliterate all of Basio's defenses. November 18th, cruisers and destroyers join the attack. Admiral Kingman says of the bombardment, we will not neutralize, we will not destroy, we will obliterate the defenses on Basio. sends their battleships and large aircraft. Once they attack us for 24 hours, it has little effect. While we wait for the enemy attack, I am assigned to a tank company and it is ready for action. As the American task force approaches Tarawa, the Marines are briefed on the assault plan. Amphibious tractors, Amtraks, will be used, as well as conventional landing craft to take them over the reef to three beaches, called Red Beaches 1, 2, and 3. After landing, the Marines are to sweep across the airfield in the center and push the enemy down the long, narrow part of the island. One officer says, some think we can take it in three hours. I think it may take a little longer. Somebody says, all we got to do is walk on this island and it's ours. It doesn't always work out that way. You sort of have in the back of your mind that it isn't going to be that easy. Early morning, November 20th, Asio comes into sight. By 3.55, the Marines have finished a steak breakfast and are going down the cargo nets into the landing craft. Basio is quiet. Enemy destroyers shower us with shells. Explosions are so heavy that you almost feel pitch or change its shape under you. You even get the feeling that it might suddenly sink into the sea forever. After 30 minutes, the shelling is halted to allow one final airstrike before the circling boats start their run into the beach. There is a blunder and the planes are late. For 20 minutes, the Japanese fire at the unprotected transports. Finally, at 6.15, carrier bombers sweep over the island for a seven-minute bombardment. Korea-based planes bomb us from the air, and in a short time, the whole island is enveloped with fire and black smoke. The naval bombardment is resumed. In two and a half hours, 3,000 tons of explosives are poured onto the island. Basio's defenders have to be obliterated, because when the first wave lands, the only armor a Marine will have is his khaki shirt. We see them coming in many landing craft. They probably think we have been overwhelmed by the bombing and shelling.
first wave of United States Marines coming into Red Beach 1 is caught in a deadly crossfire. On damaged shelters, the Japanese rake the beaches with fire, pin the troops down behind the log barrier. The tide is working for the Japanese. It is too low. Only the Amtraks have a faint chance of making it. From the beginning, landing craft are in trouble, trapped on the reef. I'm in the third wave. And even before we get into the beach, some of the first and second waves are coming back, saying the tide has changed and they can't make it onto the island. Most of the men are pinned down. on an amphibian tractor, but about 150 yards offshore, it just completely conks out. So we just have to start waiting. So many things go through your mind when something like this happens. You're in the water up to your neck, and you can't stop or anything. Nobody in front of you, and very few in back of you. And you just have to keep going. By 11 a.m., Colonel Shoup is directing the attack from a position alongside the narrow pier which juts out into the lagoon. When everything opens up, the colonel yells at us to get as close to the pier as we can. Don't go in any further. He says to stop landing troops and puts out a call for strafing. There must be 200 killed already, right in the water. By the middle of the day, most of the Amtraks have been wrecked or sunk. None of the other landing craft can make it over the reef. The bodies of dead and dying Marines are strewn across the water. Ammunition is low, water is almost gone, and plasma is exhausted. 1,500 men are pinned down along the narrow, bloody strip of sand. And from their officers, all messages to Colonel Shoup agree. Situation desperate. All afternoon of the first day, the Marines struggle to move off Tarawa's narrow beach. And all afternoon, the Japanese keep them flat in the sand. It appears that we have broken their landing attempt. The enemy craft are running aground, and enemy soldiers are falling left and right under our thundering fire. But the enemy advances through our fire along the beach, jumping over the dead bodies of their comrades. Carrier-based planes come in for almost continuous bombing and strafing. After we get past the wall, we make our way to one of the pillboxes and the colonel sets up his command post. He tells us to dig in and stand fast for the night. My foxhole is 15 feet away from our ammunition dump. If they ever hit it, we'll be blown sky high. By the end of D-Day, about 5,000 Marines have made it onto the beach and about 1,500 of them are wounded or dead. As the men dig in to spend a nightmare ashore, Colonel Shoup is heard to say, this is the damnedest crap game I ever got into. The morning of D plus one, the last of the divisional reserves start to wade the long, dangerous way over the reef. Halfway across, they are suddenly cut down by a murderous crossfire. During the night, Japanese machine gunners swim out and hide themselves in an old, half-sunken hulk. 
carrier planes come in to put them out of action. For five hours, under a blistering sun, the reserves continue battling their way ashore. When Colonel Shoup calls for more reserves, the answer he gets is, we are ready to land the cooks and truck drivers. Finally, at noon on D plus one, more than 36 hours late, the tide rises. And with it rise the hopes of the desperate invasion force. For the first time, landing craft begin to slip over the top of the reef. Men and supplies pour onto the beach. By four o'clock, Colonel Shoup reports, our casualties heavy, enemy casualties unknown. Situation, we are winning. By the middle of the afternoon, some of the Marines have broken out of the beachhead, are fighting their way across the island. By five o'clock, they are across the airfield and have a foothold on the southern shore. The island is split in two. Our forces have lost much food and ammunition, and we are no longer a match for the enemy. In spite of all, our soldiers courageously fight and shake the guts of the American forces. All afternoon, casualties are evacuated. The landing craft moved them out to the waiting ships in a steady shuttle service. First, I am with two comrades, and they were ahead of me. Suddenly, they are exposed an enemy shell with a thundering blast, and my two comrades are gone. They have disappeared, blown to bits without a trace in a split second. The smell of death is nauseating in the tropic heat. Even while the battle continues, mass graves are scooped out and filled. As much as we hate to see it happen, the only way of getting rid of the bodies is to take a bulldozer and bury the Americans on one side and the Japanese on the other. There's too many dead on this campaign. On the morning of D plus two, the Japanese commander on Tarawa sends out his last message. Our weapons have been destroyed, and from now on, everyone is attempting a final charge. May Japan exist for 10,000 years. The morning of D plus three dawns on another sickening scene. Last night, the Japanese ran screaming into the marine lines in a last frantic bonsai charge. They're dead, 300 of them are strewn across a grim landscape. Only 500 Japanese are still alive, and against these, the Marines move in a steady and relentless drive. Eight in the morning until three in the afternoon, the Marines systematically kill 475 of the 500 remaining Japanese. begin to find out that the bombing hasn't really knocked out those big pillboxes. They are practically untouched. 
So we try with the flamethrowers. You have to get up close enough to the slits in the pillboxes so you can burn them out. And then get around to the back entrance and just dig them out. After we secure some of these pillboxes, we find bodies inside are practically stacked on top of each other. I wait in our bunker for the time we will make our last charge. Suddenly our bunker is turned into a fire of hell in one second by the Americans. Inside it is completely burning. Gradually I become conscious. I'm pressed under something heavy and cannot move my body. I'm pressed under the charred bodies of my fellow soldiers. But I still have life. When I get out, I cannot believe it. And I just stand as in a dream. CBs and Marine engineers work all morning on the airstrip. At noon, the first carrier-based plane comes in for a landing. 1.12 in the afternoon, not quite 76 hours after the first Marine hit the beach, Tarawa is declared secure. Mickey Franklin, now a sergeant, receives several shrapnel wounds and sees no more action. Chief Petty Officer Kadeo Onuki is one of only 17 Japanese to survive the Battle of Tarawa. He is later amazed when his captors give him medical attention instead of killing him. The war comes to an end for Onuki in the American prisoner of war camp in Texas. The two square mile patch of coral is a devastated prize, a burned and blackened graveyard for 4,500 Japanese, for more than 1,000 Americans.